develop under Tom Clancy franchise, it means uh, it means that you need to validate and to justify everything. It takes place in a very near future, so uh, you need to use a political environment that is believable, that, that is linked to the actual situation. You need to use gadgets that are already existing, that are already used by special forces, or a gadget that is currently in research that is believable to exist in the very near future. We really want the player to feel that, oh my god, uh, this could happen for real, like tomorrow. The NSA created this solo operative that can react quickly. It can be, of course, a little more stealth than uh, classical um, counter-terrorist squads. When Sam Fisher is on the field, he receives order from a US government and he doesn't care about international treaties or uh, political, any political agreement. He just, he do what he needs to do. It could be good thing, it could be very bad things. And he has to do it secretly without leaving a trace. He can play safe by shooting most of the light and make a safe path through the level. He can also decide to shoot a little more on the enemy. Or he can also decide to use the environment to create distractions and sneak behind the guards. If he fails and is detected, uh, US government will instantly deny his involvement in this mission. It's all about mixing those features together that would provide either interesting gameplays or uh, interesting graphic uh, results. Have kept the bright flame That's the of secure American line, honey. freedom it's for burning me. throughout oh. the world. Hello, Lambert. As far as the research that went into coming up with Sam uh, concept and looked, we uh, looking at the, the script. The script was describing Sam as a seasoned veteran. Um, uh, really like a career soldier basically and um, and all the background that was described in the script was the fact that he was a next CIA uh, operative also an ex Navy SEAL team member so one of our first idea was to uh, to have Sam uh, sporting white hair it looked okay but the feedback we got from a lot of people uh, was the fact that Sam looked too old at that point not not as much as a season but more as a retired soldier which was exactly way off what we wanted in the first place. So we've decided to uh, tone down the white hair and just kept it on the sides and uh, do the more black hair type of look, which also was associated with the stealth part of the character. So we've, uh, we've decided to go for that for the final uh, concept. Almost the same thing Sam uses, but a more advanced prototype. I get the, uh, I get what the ordinary people get. Sam's suit was based on a prototype that's being tested right now by the Navy SEALs, which is a wetsuit that you can wear in and out of water and is a suit that adapts itself to uh, temperature changes. We thought it would just fit the character, basically, since our game is based on a near-future type of setting. If you look at Sam's vest and all his pouches and equipment, it's all stuff that's lightweight, compact. Um, since Sam is a solo operative, uh, we've decided to keep those elements in there, uh, give him as much cargo space as possible, but at the same time without all that cargo being too cumbersome for the player. So this is something we, uh, we've kept throughout the design. We decided to go with uh, Antron uh, animation because we wanted to have a uh, unique style, uh, especially for Sam. Sometimes we would uh, we would use uh, video footage of ourselves acting uh, emotion movement and use it as a reference for key poses and timing. For complex move like the split jump, we go directly to 3D, applying the basic animation notions until it fits the style. The inspiration came from a lot of sources. Uh, for moves like rappelling, uh, we use realistic SWAT tactics. 
We also wanted to have action moves in, in the game, so for uh, rolling, split jump, force cooperation, human shield, we turn to Harvey, movies. I don't shoot! Please! I somebody to cover my patrol while I make a push stop. Any walking, jogging, sneaking, or weight cycles need to be tweaked a lot because they're really critical to game. These are the animation that you see the most. Everything on the character is animated. Uh, we have 10 bones just for the face. Um, we can make them blink, smile, get angry. Uh, it's that portion of the animation that can make the whole difference. Sam's goggle became an important part of his appearance because we wanted to come up with a design that would make that character recognizable to the player as much as Batman is recognizable to uh, a lot of people, just uh, the cape silhouette with the pointy ears. We wanted to have something that would have the same effect, so the silhouette with the three dots, which are actually lights emanating from the uh, night vision. Um, I think just that fact alone makes Sam recognizable to a lot of people, and uh, since our game is based on uh, light and stealth, uh, you see that repeatedly in the game. You just see Sam coming out of the shadows with the three dots. So um, this is why the uh, the goggles are such an important part of his uh, of his uh, suit. The level designer's job is really to build. Uh, the content of the game. They build the actual environments. The game designer is uh, responsible for the, the core design and the core mechanics and the core systems of the game and sort of making sure that from level to level the progression of difficulty, the, the gameplay challenges uh, progress in a, in a way that the player can keep up with the challenge. You need to make sure that uh, things are consistent, that the player is learning from level to level uh, how to pass the necessary challenges, and those challenges aren't just changing uh, randomly from level to level. A door always needs to open the same way for the player. Um, guns need to work in a consistent fashion. All the systems need to be consistent because you can't keep teaching the player the same systems again and again. You have to make sure he learns them once and then is able to build on that knowledge rather than having to learn the same things multiple times. You can start with a very simple challenge in, in an early level, like uh, level one, you'll learn how to climb a pipe. Uh, come level three, you'll, you'll want the player to have to climb that pipe again, but in a slightly different, slightly more challenging scenario where there might be an enemy looking out the window. Uh, and then in level five or level seven, you're gonna have uh, the player climbing a pipe with an enemy looking out the window with a moving dynamic light uh, searching the, the area of the pipe. Once the player has learned a set of skills uh, in, in one part of one map or over a, the course of a few maps, you want to uh, then encourage the player to face all of these challenges simultaneously or in close proximity to each other. The first step in level design uh, creation is to have the artists uh, create a huge bank of models. We wanted to have uh, as many objects as possible before even thinking of, uh, about how the maps would look. Then we created each map's base on what's uh, written in the scenario. We wanted to have a very clear uh, idea of the environment and uh, what the gameplay would be uh, before going on to the 3D stuff. Generally, we, uh, the atmosphere we wanted to create in each map was uh, danger. The objective of uh, great level design isn't to make maps that would confuse a player like a maze. Instead, we wanted to make uh, the player feel powerful. Uh, that means uh, giving them uh, a cool character to, to play with and uh, the right weapon to use, but also um, giving them the right environment to be part of. Unlike other games, in Splinter Cell, we wanted to, uh, the shadow to be a safe territory for the player and bright areas to be the dangerous territory. With smaller environments, uh, we could make the gameplay much more intense, put the player much closer to the enemies, and it let Sam Fisher interact with the, the light and shadow much more effectively. The idea was to make uh, a fully interactive environment, make it possible to shoot a computer, take a soda can, and to uh, distract an enemies. Um, but much more importantly, to shoot out lights. Shooting lights allow for a different gameplay experience depending on uh, basically how you play. That was the ultimate goal, and uh, well, we made it happen. So in order to create an environment rich with shadow, we had to design a dynamic lighting system. 
we had to start with a very strong base engine. We chose to work with the Unreal Engine because it offered the power and the flexibility we need. Everything in the game world cast a shadow. This means that the player could interact with light and shadow like never before. They can use shadow to hide in. They could also detect enemies by seeing only the shadow. We realized that Splinter Cell had a lot of unique elements, but we wanted to attract players on the game on a visual basis. We had to get them to pick up the game first before they could discover all the other features. So we add some visual touches like the soft physics system, which use what we call soft body. Soft body are anything in the environment that isn't solid, like curtains and flags. This was the unique visual that we need to differentiate Splinter Cell from the other game. Sam's a very frightened guy, you know. That's why he sort of walks in and does stuff like, hi, I'm gonna kill you. Because if you're a happy guy, you come in and go, hi, I'm gonna kill you. Uh, here we go, Fisher inter interrogates enemy soldiers who obviously have no information, but he just interrogates them for the hell of it. Stay quiet, you don't want your life to end in the boys' room. I want you to answer some questions. Stay quiet. You don't want your life to end in the boys' room. I want you to answer some questions. When I'm breaking down a character, I usually try and find six to eight levels emotional. Um, if they're violent characters, I base them on fear, you know. Uh, there's only really two disciplines in the universe, love and fear. Why are you here? Why is the Russian military here? Why is the Russian military here? No, it's very hard to do something in an artificial environment and make it real. Who do you work for? And I thought I'd, I'd like to try it, to see if I could fit in, because I'm more of a reactor. Hey, smile, try and blink, say cheese, thank you. <laughs> given the limitations of the dialogue, given the limitations of the responses and the choices within the game, put character and personality into that, I think I succeeded. Let me do this last one. Bob's your uncle. <laughs> this whole Cold War espionage sneaking around thing, we need to develop the sounds and use sounds that are going to benefit um, the darkness and still work. So we did use um, a few, uh, let's say, ethnic instruments in the areas that we're at. When, when we're in Georgia, we have some Georgian guitars and Armenian voices. And when we're in Burma, we've got some Burmese voices and some Burmese drums and things like that. The actual technical side of writing music for video games is a whole different breed than any other field of music. And uh, I think it really, um, the, the constraints are larger. I mean, smaller constraints, they, they tie you in a little better, but it forces you to be more creative. Show yourself. So what we did was we brought in a whole bunch of different styles together from classical to electronica to ambient to world and to trying to find a happy balance between all three of them to come up with the sound. We still have the little sense of orchestral in there which brings the emotion out in the combats. The openness of the gameplay um, has a tendency to trigger multiple events. Uh, the fact that you can pursue your investigation as the character, we can quickly run into uh, trouble there where uh, you've set off alarms, you have, you're in the middle of a conversation with uh, Lambert, um, you're being attacked by guards and uh, you're trying to hide and you've got your night goggles on. You know the fact that all of those things right? could happen at the same time we'll makes for quite a lot of complexity in the design. Like Making the sounds for the video game is, is very similar to the way you make sound for a movie. I think that probably the most important thing is to be able to have oral imagination. That's to say, be able to imagine in your head 
how it should sound, and then be able to produce those sounds. Making Sam Fisher truly sympathetic, um, because he's, at some levels, he's a ninja guy. He's highly trained and very cool, calm and collected. At the same time, you want to have a connection with him as a human being who's facing danger. So actually giving him an oral signature that made you really feel that you were the, that person as a player. I provide as much context as I can to the people that are producing the resources, giving them as much information as I can about what's going on in the game, where this sound will play. We don't recycle sounds. Our sound effects are created from the bottom up. When we have a gun sound, we record a gun, and it's that attention to detail with all of the sounds and making them be truly unique for this game. So, Sam, what was your role in the development of Splinter Cell? My role in the development of Splinter Cell? Hmm. Well, first Ubisoft brought me in as a technical advisor. For the sake of realism, they wanted input from someone who actually, well, somebody who actually does this kind of work. But you ended up being the star. How did that happen? <laughs> They'd always wanted someone a little older, more professional, more experienced, you know. Not some young goofball that you see in your typical shooter. I think Martin Kaya was the one who decided to actually make me the character, and, you know, instead of somebody who was based on me. And how did you find working with the rest of the team? I've had the good fortune in my life to work with a lot of really talented and professional people. U.S. Navy SEALs, folks at third echelon, all real pros. It was no different here. What was the hardest part of the job? Without a doubt, animation. <laughs> the decision was made that they didn't want to use mocap. They wanted a more artistic feel, so it's all done by hand. So here I am, hanging off everything in the office while Steve and the animators are filming me, you know, to see how I move. Man, I must have spent hours doing the split jump. <laughs> I hated that part of the job. Speaking of the artistic feel of the Splinter Cell, what are your thoughts on the game's graphics? Well, most of my experience with video games comes in the form of military training simulators. Needless to say, we're not even the same ballpark here. The fact that Splinter Cell uses light and shadows. I move from the light into the shadows, hide, I'm able to hide. The fact that they use this as the core game mechanic means that these lights, well, they're dramatic and beautiful, but they also create a real dramatic tension and evoke a strong mood. One more question, Sam. What about the rumors there is a sequel in the works? Have you signed on for Splinter Cell 2? Unfortunately, I'm not authorized to discuss those matters at this time. <laughs>